Hello everybody and you're very welcome to the HPRA's second day of the medical device webinar series. My name is Nicola Hickey. I'm the regulatory and policy manager in the medical device department and I'm delighted to welcome you to day two of our live webinar event. Many of you will have joined us yesterday to kick off our webinar series and the remainder of this week is scheduled to address more specific topics with today's focus being on implementation of the IVDR. So I, I, I guess in terms of the topics for today, um, we have two specific areas, the new IVD classification system and the area of clinical data and requirements for IVD performance evaluations. Um, so before I hand over to our speakers today, I'd like to remind you of some of the housekeeping rules um, for this live event. So as attendees, you're on the live event and you'll be able to listen, but you won't be able to speak or turn on your cameras. You will be able to ask questions in the Q&A tab, which is visible on the toolbar in the top right hand corner. Um, we're conscious that we have a large number of registrants online today, so you know we may not be able to ask your specific question. We will have time scheduled in at the end to take some questions and we will try and take those that are more broad reaching in nature where we can. Um, we'll run, to, run through the two presentations back to back and take questions on both then at the end. And so without further delay, I'm delighted to welcome our two speakers today to the event. Our first speaker is Avril Aylward. Avril is our IVD operations manager. Um, she has 20 years experience with uh, the IVD industry working in quality and regulatory affairs roles uh, in both medical devices and IVDs. Avril started uh, with us here in the HPRA in 2019 and we're delighted to have Avril present today on IVD classification. So I'll hand over to you now Avril to for your presentation. Thank you very much Nicola and good morning everyone. Hope you can hear me okay. So with the new IVDR classification guidance complete, this session will provide insight into some of the practical considerations with the IVDR classification rules and also some key implications for consideration when applying those rules to your devices. So the topics I'm going to cover are the IVDR implementation and some of the challenges which remain. The IVDR classification rules and principles, the draft classification guidance um, which is due out in the near future and I'll go through some classification examples. So many challenges still remain. We can hear, see here the timeline which we're all very used um, to looking at. Many challenges still remain in the path towards IVD implementation in May 2022. We are now at November 2020 and with one and a half years to go, just 18 months, a lot has been accomplished but there is still a lot to do. Competent authorities and the EU Commission are very aware of the requirements to have all the necessary steps in place in time for application of the IVDR in May 2022. Some critical areas that have been identified are capacity of notified bodies, EURLs and expert panels. We here at the HPRA are aware that there's still a lot of work to do and all key stakeholders are working to ensure that everything that needs to be in place is there in time. As outlined yesterday by Anna May Apestelas from the EU Commission, there is discussion ongoing at an EU level to identify priorities and resources and the actions needed to ensure all is in place in time for May 2022. So then looking at the classification rules and the principles around uh, classification. So application of the classification rules is governed by the intended purpose of the device. It is very important firstly to define the intended purpose, taking into account all of the aspects of the device as outlined. So what's being tested, what is the particular sample type to use, what is the clinical application, who is the end user of the device and what environment will the device be used in and who is the patient. So all of these need to be taken in, into account when defining the internal purpose. And the reason for this is that application of the classification rules is very much governed by the intended purpose of the device. 
So then there are 10 implementing rules as per Annex 8 of the IVDR. And then there are seven risk-based rules. This risk-based system is very important to ensure that the level of regulatory oversight is proportionate to the risk of the device. So some devices um, can detect the same analyte, but for different intended purposes. And a good example of this is the syphilis test. This example is outlined in the classification guidance, which is currently in draft. So if the intended purpose of the syphilis test is to screen blood and tissue donations, keeping in mind the implementing rules one to 10, and beginning with rule one of the risk-based rules, um, it is um, this device in, in this case with this intended purpose would fall into uh, rule one of the risk-based classification rules and would be classified as class D. However, with a different intended purpose, with the intended purpose of diagnosis in the individual, again, keeping in mind the implementing rules, um, then you would start moving through your risk-based rules. So at uh, this time, you'd, it wouldn't lie within uh, rule one. It wouldn't lie within rule two. And when you come to rule three, um, it would lie within rule 3A would be applied. It's a sexually transmitted agent. And in this case, it would be classified as rule C. So this is a good example of the intended purpose and how it uh, governs the eventual classification of the device. So then, as I mentioned at the beginning, there is a classification guidance in draft. Uh, so it's a guidance on the classification rules as outlined in the um, IVDR. Um, so this has been drafted by an expert group consisting of the um, MDCG, competent authorities, the EU Commission, notified bodies and also industry. This is a very useful guidance on IVDR classification rules and the application of rules. It's a great supplement um, and is really useful because it provides many important definitions, relevant definitions. Um, it outlines the principles, um, as I've already alluded to in the previous slide. Um, it provides many examples. It's, it's a non-exhaustive list, but the examples are very um, helpful in applying the rules and helping you um, because there is a wide variety of examples provided. There are seven risk-based rules and they are individually um, explained in detail in this classification and it's, it's really um, should be in the toolkit of um, everybody who's um, involved in classifying devices. So then, as we know, there is classification, um, the lowest risk classification group is in class A, and then it goes all the way up to the highest risk classification of cl classification of class D. So um, just looking, first of all, at class A and looking at some examples. So again, examples here are for illustrative purposes only. The final device classification will depend on the intended purpose and the application of the rules. Um, so in group A, we have, it's the lowest classification of devices. In this group, we'd have um, devices like specimen receptacles, some buffers. Uh, some analyzers will fall into class A depending on the specific intended purpose and also some histological stains. Class B then is a little more high risk. Uh, some of the self tests um, which aren't in class C will be in um, class B. Uh, so, for example, a pregnancy test um, or some urine tests and uh, controls. And then, um, importantly, any device as per rule six, which doesn't fall into any of the other classes, any of the other risk classes, will fall into class B. And then class C has many devices, which we are all familiar with. So, uh, including companion diagnostics, um, a glucose uh, meter. Uh, blood glucose meter, uh, some cancer tests um, and some infectious diseases will fall under class C. And then the highest risk classification group is class D. And this contains many of the devices which are currently in Annex 2 of the current IVD directive. Uh, so transmissible agents 
high risk um, ones, which are, for example, hepatitis B and HIV, and also some specified uh, blood groups. So now we're going to continue looking at some examples. So this example also is taken from the classification guidance. Uh, so it's non-typhidal anti-salmonella antibodies. So the classification of this device is a good example of how to class to use all the rules, uh, both all the implementing rules and all the risk, especially the risk-based rules. Um, so this test is looking at detection of antibodies for non-typhidal um, salmonella. So non-typhidal salmonella is a primary cause of gastroenteritis uh, and would have symptoms such as diarrhea. This test is for exposure only um, to this condition and so an incorrect result would not lead to any severe health impact. So that's important to take into account when defining the intended purpose and you can see the little test tube here where you're just looking uh, for antibodies um, to the non-typhidal anti-salmonella. So again, defining the, intended defining the intended purpose is very important. So it's an enzyme immunoassay to detect exposure to an infectious agent, non-typhidal salmonella, and it's in human blood. So then taking all the implementing rules, one to 10 into account, and beginning then to move through the risk-based rules. So as we move to rule one, this isn't, um, a transmissible um, agent. It's not going to be um, used in blood or tissue compatibility. Um, it's um, not a life-threatening disease. So moving then down, it doesn't fall into the classification rule two, two. And then moving down through the classification rules. So rule three um, has many different um, uh, ones in it. So it starts off sexually transmitted agents. So it's not that. So you move down through each one. It's not a human genetic test. So there's money to go through here, but you need to consider each one as you move through. So coming all the way down, you'll have ruled them all out as you go. Um, it's not a congenital disorder. Finally, then coming to rule four, it's not a self test and it's not a near patient test. So again, that would have to be defined in the attended use. It's, a, it's not a general lab product and it's not an instrument. So then finally you come to rule six. So we mentioned this earlier. So um, rule six um, states that the device is not covered by rule one to five will fall into class B. Have a look at rule seven then, that's in relation to um, controls, um, if it's a control. So that would bring it into class B um, as well. But um, this is really based on rule six and this would end up being um, classified as a class B device. So the next example is a nice uh, topical one. Um, so it's in relation to the current uh, coronavirus pandemic um, and a device um, that is for SARS-CoV-2, it's a rapid antigen test. Um, so it's a lateral flow test um, and just the little image there on the left, as you can see, for anyone that's not familiar, it's a test, it's a lateral flow test, it's similar uh, to a pregnancy test. So the sample is dropped in where the little circle is and then it flows down um, through the system and then um, there's antibodies and if there's antigens in the sample, they will react and you'll get a test line and then you'll also usually have a control line as well as a control for the test. So again, defining the intended purpose. So it's a lateral flow immunoassay intended for the rapid qualitative detection of the specific protein antigen associated with SARS-CoV-2 in nasal swab. And it's for professional use only. So these tests, general, um, they're generally called rapid. They take about 15 minutes. So again, in this case, for this example, you would move through the implementing rules. And in this case, um, very importantly, um, this device would fall into class D. Um, it's uh, detecting the presence of a transmissible agent that could cause life-threatening disease and high risk propagation, high risk of propagation, as we all know. So currently, um, it's any tests for uh, SARS-CoV-2 are falling into um, the general category and uh, they don't have a large amount of oversight. So this is a very good example of the requirement of applying the 
proportionate um, degree of oversight to a device based on the risk associated with it. So now we're going to look a bit at uh, software. And um, in terms of software, we need to think about qualification as well as classification. So qualification as IVD software must be established prior to application of the classification rules. So you need to start again with defining the intended purpose as before. A detailed intended purpose ensures a correct qualification and the outcome of the qualification will result in a correct, um, will lead then to the classification. So in support of this, a guidance document has been endorsed by uh, the Medical Device Coordination Group, which was published in October 2019. And this outlines the definitions of software, medical device software and IVD software. So um, it also covers software which is driving or influencing a device and calls that all implementing rules in Annex 8 um, should be considered in line with all um, the, the risk-based rules. So implementing rule 1.4 is only applicable for software which drives or influences the use of an in vitro diagnostic medical device. This rule should also be considered at least as an orientation for finding the right classification of software which is placed on the market in combination with a hardware um, medical device. Then according to the second indent of rule 1.4, if the software is independent of any other device, it shall be classified in its own right. In determining the proper classification of medical device software under the IVDR, the manufacturer shall consider all classification and implementing rules as of the IVDR. And again, as spelled out by implementing rule 1.1 of Annex 8 of the IVDR, the application of the classification rules shall be governed by the intended purpose of the medical device software. So then um, there is many examples as well um, called out um, in, this classic, in this qualification guidance um, under the IVDR. So um, it's very important um, to use this again as another tool um, in support of um, applying uh, the classification prior to applying the classification rules and then eventually um, coming up with your final classification into A, B, C or D. So now we're going to look at companion diagnostics. So companion diagnostics are defined in the IVDR as devices essential for the safe and infected and effective use of a corresponding medicinal product in order to identify before and or during treatment either patients who are most likely to benefit from that medicinal product or patients that are likely to be at increased risk of serious adverse reactions as a result of treatment with this specific medicinal product. So again there's the um, Definition of a companion di diagnostics, as we all know, is specified in the IBD IBDR in Article 2. Um, so it's also important um, to identify what the specify and define the intended purpose. So in this case, it's a companion diagnostic intended for the detection of a specific protein associated with lung cancer in tissue. And it's indicated as an aid in identifying what patients are eligible for treatment with a specific drug. Um, so this intended use shows that this device is very specific, targeted toward a specific protein. And then if that's present, identifying patients who are eligible for one, either one or other of a specific drug. So then you move through your um, implementing rules, again, making sure to consider all rules, move through your classification rules, one, two, and then rule three F. So you'll rule out rule one, rule two, and then uh, rule three F specifically applies to companion diagnostics and states that they fall into classification group C. So then it's also important to note um, specific devices that may not be a companion diagnostics and you might be you mightn't be clear. So 
devices that are intended to be used for monitoring treatment with a medicinal product in order to ensure that the concentration of relevant substances in the human body is within a therapeutic window are not actually considered to be companion diagnostics. They're not specific enough to that spe particular med medicinal product and hasn't been developed along with that um, device to be used with it, with that medicinal product to be used with it to determine benefit um, or any adverse health aspects for the patient. So one example would be INR tests, which are intended for use by professional users for the quantitative detection of, to quantify prothrombin time in the monitoring of warfarin therapy. So this is not specific enough. It's more of a general um, medical device not um, and would have to go through all the rules and not um, the uh, wouldn't fall into rule 3f um, and be a companion diagnostic and then another uh, common example then would be a blood glucose monitor um, so measuring glucose in human blood so these um, values that, that you would um, obtain from using this device may be used um, in determining insulin doses, but um, it's not specific enough um, and it would have to, again, go through all the rules um, implementing and risk-based rules, but wouldn't fall under Rule 3F as a companion diagnostic. So then the final takeaways um, from uh, the presentation today. So many challenges remain in the implementation of the, of the IVDR, and we are all very aware of those and working um, towards um, prioritising and getting everything in place by May 2022. Again, just to bring home again the importance of defining the intended use um, in order um, to uh, classify your device um, appropriately um, so that the appropriate oversight, regulatory oversight, is applied to the device based on the risk associated with it. And in support of this, you need to imply, apply, consider all the rules, so both the implementation rules and the classification rules. The draft guidance is due to be published shortly, and this would be a very useful tool. Um, also, the uh, software uh, qualification guidance that we mentioned. And then also there's a HPRA classification process um, and that's described on our, our website um, for further information. So thank you very much for listening. There's some further information available at these websites. Um, I welcome questions in due course uh, following Philip's presentation. Thank you for listening and I'll hand back over to Nicola. Thank you. Thanks very much, Avril, um, for that presentation. And I think you've covered some of the very practical elements on what to expect from the new IVDR classification guidance. I think the benefit of examples is great in illustrating some of the implementing rules and how to apply them. And I'm sure we'll have some questions on this shortly. Um, but I, I guess before I hand over to Philip, um, our second speaker, I noticed there was a, a comment in the chat there about the availability of these webinars, uh, the, the sessions, and we will um, try to make them available, make the recordings available on our website in due course. Um, if for any external speakers, we just need to get their permission, but, but we, we hope to have, have them available. Um, so now I think it's time for me to hand over to Dr. Philip Kelly. Uh, Philip joined the HPRA in uh, 2016 from academia and his work is focused specifically on IVD technical assessment. Um, Philip represents the HPRA on a number of European task forces developing guidance on the IVDR. Philip's presentation is on performance evaluation and IVDs and I'll hand over to Philip now to introduce the topic. Thank you, Nicola. Um, welcome all. Uh, so my name is Philip and I'm going to talk to you today about performance evaluation. Uh, and as some of you may be aware, this is quite a large topic and there's, there's a lot of uh, information in it. So today I'm going to focus on the, the general principles of performance evaluation and also try and give some practical advice where I can about how to go about planning and preparing for, uh, for the IVD work. So just as a quick overview, uh, I'm going to discuss uh, what is clinical evidence, what is the performance evaluation, the different components of performance evaluation culminating in the performance evaluation report, uh, 
And then I'm going to take a little bit of time to discuss the life cycle approach that's called out in the IVDR uh, with a focus on how post-market considerations can influence the clinical evidence of your device. So to start with, well, what is clinical evidence? There's a, a definition provided in the IVDR Article 2, but essentially clinical evidence is the data which supports the use of your device. And it's required for all devices, regardless of class. Um, the important thing is though, it's based on assessed data. So it's not just a collection of data associated with your device. There is an assessment process that has to, to take place to, to show that your, your uh, data does support the use of your device and it's used to, to demonstrate compliance with the IVDR. So on the left here, I, I have a figure which kind of uh, outlines the performance evaluation process. And um, so at the bottom of this, uh, this figure, it starts with the plan. So the performance evaluation plan sets out how you're going to conduct the performance evaluation for your device. And there's three pillars or three headings which you're going to examine um, during this process. There's scientific validity, analytical performance, and clinical performance. And I'll go through each of these in, in more detail as the slides progress. The outcome of your, uh, your findings from these three pillars are documented in your, your performance evaluation report, which forms the foundation of your clinical evidence. It's important to note that, as with, with most processes, there's a, a kind of a plan, do, assess, report element to this. So you start by planning out what you're going to do. You do it, so you collect the data um, for each of the three pillars. You then assess the data, and then uh, based on your assessment, you, you put the data into to a report. And as I kind of mentioned before, this is a, a dynamic process that uh, where the clinical evidence gets updated throughout the life cycle, and I'll touch off that more towards the end of the presentation. So with the HPRA, uh, we, we put patients at the center of everything we do. And when you consider how an IVD works to, to serve patients, there are really three elements that you, you need to consider. So there's the analyte, there's the device, and then there's the clinical condition. Scientific validity is the link between the analyte and the clinical condition. Analytical performance is the link between the analyte and the device. And clinical performance is the link between the device and the clinical condition. So. An example of that to kind of explain what I mean by that is if you take um, CD4 positive cells in relation to HIV infection, well, the scientific validity um, is the link between the actual cell, the, the CD4 positive cells and the HIV infection. So uh, some of you may be aware that in HIV infection, the virus actually replicates inside CD4 positive cells and it tends to be quite detrimental to the cells. It destroys them. So if you have a very low count of CD4 positive cells, that's indicative of a very active infection. So the scientific validity would describe how the analyte is linked to the infection itself. In terms of analytical performance, if we take, for example, a kit that is used with flow cytometry to count uh, CD4 positive cells, well, the analytical performance really describes how the device is able to uh, detect the uh, the analyte. So, you know, what is the limit of detection? Are there any interferences that need to be considered? And then the clinical performance is the link between the device and the clinical condition. So in the target population for the intended use as specified in the instructions for use and technical documentation, how does this device hold up to actually, you know, det determining the clinical condition? So uh, the performance evaluation process, as I mentioned, starts with, with the plan and the plan, uh, the list of requirements is, is found in Annex 13 of the IVDR, but the plan starts out by documenting certain aspects of device that, that are known. So you specify an intended purpose. You would know the analyzer marker that the device is intended to look at, the target populations. And we're also kind of set out a description of the state of the art uh, at the entry point in, in, in this process. But importantly, the plan should also describe how you're going to conduct the performance evaluation. So under each of the three pillars, what data or source are you going to consider? And uh, very importantly, if to include acceptance criteria. And that's an important note because if you don't have acceptance criteria, you don't know when you've collected sufficient data, you don't know when to end the process. So it's important to include information about when you know you've uh, obtained enough data to support the use of your device. Uh, and there should also be some information there about how to determine that the benefit risk ratio for your device is acceptable. So as a general approach, when you're considering uh, looking at scientific validity, analytical performance or clinical performance, um, the first thing you should do is identify the information that you have available to you now. What data do you have under each of these three headings? Then assess the data or appraise the data and uh, determine is this sufficient to support the use of the device? And if not, um, you know, 
Is there a need to generate additional data or is there a need to look at other sources of data to support the use of the device? So what does that look like for scientific validity then? So again, just to recap, scientific validity is the link between the analyte and the clinical condition. And I have a number of boxes up here which are potential sources of, of data that you could, you could uh, leverage. So you could use scientific peer reviewed literature, depending on the device, there might be some professional body guidance about how the device could be used. And uh, you might have clinical performance studies available or there could be proof of concept studies or, or other studies available. So if you think about an existing IVD or an IVD that's been on the market for a while, it's likely you have more existing evidence already available to you. Whereas if you have a novel device with a novel analyte or a novel purpose, there might not be a sufficient body of existing evidence. You might need to consider doing uh, additional studies to generate the data that you need to, to support the use of the device. Uh, again, um, this process, it, once you've collected all the, the data, you should appraise it. And if the evidence is determined to be insufficient, then you need to go back and, and cycle back and look at other sources. But if you determine it to be sufficient, that can be included then in, uh, in the report. Um, for analytical performance, this is the link between the um, the device and the, the analyte in question. So uh, most of the time uh, analytical performance is based on performance studies. So this would be where you actually go out and measure how good your device is at detecting a, a specific parameters of the analyte. So again, limited detection, interferences, you know, accuracy, reproducibility, those kind of parameters. And it should take into account the, the generally acknowledged state of the art. And one way of, of doing this is to use where available certified reference materials or methods. This not only allows you to uh, have metrological traceability, but it allows you to ground your studies and your analytical performance uh, against a, a known reference. And there's a number of different parameters that are called out in the IVDR, which can be found in Annex 1 for, for those who are interested. So clinical performance, that's the link between the, the clinical condition in, in a patient and the, uh, the device. So how good is the device that actually, you know, predicting or detecting a specific physiological or, or pathological process. And that's really in place to, to demonstrate that the IVD has been tested for the, the intended use in the, in, in the right population, that the target population, under the use conditions that it's going to be used on the market. And some examples of clinical performance indicators that you may be familiar with would be the likes of diagnostic sensitivity, which is uh, an indication of whether a device is able to correctly identify those uh, with a disease, or diagnostic specificity, the same would correctly identify those without a disease. Or you could be looking at other parameters or other indicators, depending on what kind of device you have or what the specifics are. And again, this is very similar to scientific validity. If you have clinical performance, there might be some existing data already available. So you could have peer reviewed literature, or there could be also published experience from routine diagnostic testing out there, um, demonstrating how your device is able to be used in a, in a clinical setting. And again, if you have a, an existing device, it's likely that there's more of this, uh, this existing data available to you. Uh, if there's not, or if you have a novel device, then you might need to consider doing a prospective clinical performance study to generate the, the evidence required. And again, similar to, to all the processes, you should appraise the data and determine that it's sufficient um, before proceeding to the report. And then the performance evaluation report is really in place to collate the data from uh, your assessment of the scientific validity analytical performance and clinical performance. And it, it's there to, to demonstrate and verify that you're, you've met the requirements of the general safety performance requirements in, in Annex 1. So this is also called your clinical evidence for your device, and it's the basis of the clinical evidence. But as I've mentioned, there is a life cycle approach to performance data and performance uh, evaluation. So the clinical evidence is expected to be updated throughout the life cycle of the device. And how you do that is you leverage information from a post-market performance follow-up and post-market surveillance system. And I'll discuss now in a little bit of detail how you could consider going about doing that. So I've shown this figure, uh, figure previously. This is really, again, the foundations of where your clinical evidence comes from, grounded in your performance evaluation process, uh, looking at scientific validity, analytical performance, and clinical performance. But then there's this other process um, which, which comes in, which looks at mostly at your, your post-market uh, data that's available to you. So there's a post-market performance follow-up process which starts with a plan that outlines how you're going to go about uh, collecting data uh, in, a in the post-market phase about the performance of your device. That also takes into account information from your post-market surveillance plan uh, which outlines how you're going to go about collecting and, survey and maintaining surveillance of devices on the market and it culminates in a report. 
And the output, the output of this in conjunction with the Class A and Class B devices, um, the post-market surveillance report and the periodic safety update report are used to uh, update the clinical evidence of your device uh, periodically. And I just have at the top here, risk of course spans across all these processes. It's central to, uh, to most things we do in medical devices. So I know there's a lot to take into account uh, here and it looks like quite a busy, busy figure. So I'm going to go through uh, each of the elements in a little bit more detail and then I'll summarize again at, at the end. So the post-market performance follow-up process um, is really, as I said, it's in place to show, to collect data on the performance of your device on the market. And it starts with a plan and that plan is there to outline how are you going, what methods and procedures you're going to use, how are you going to go about collecting and evaluating safety and performance data. So the aim of it is to confirm the safety and performance of the device throughout its lifetime, to identify previously unknown risks or emerging risks, possible systematic misuse, and it's important that it's based on factual evidence. Um, so an example of this is, you know, you could have uh, you know, uh, some literature that comes out about, you know, a, a new strain or of if you're looking at a molecular test, for example, or, you know, uh, a new interferent. And maybe this could be a, an input to your um, your performance that you need to consider as part of post-market performance follow-up. And then once you've collected the data, you analyze and document the findings in your post-market fo performance follow-up report, and you can use this information to, to feed into your clinical. You can also leverage information from your post-market surveillance. So again, there's a, uh, the requirements for a post-market surveillance plan are, are called out in Annex 3 of the IVDR, and this plan is in place to really address the collection and utilization of, of information. In particular, you'd have the likes of uh, serious incidents or non-serious incidents, field safety corrective actions, trend reporting, and uh, relevant specialist or technical literature. So the, the requirement for post-market surveillance is, is there already, but you can utilize this to uh, really assist when you're collecting um, information to update your, your clinical evidence. So by assessing, uh, by assessing that information, you then, um, sorry, by assessing that information, you then have to document that information in, in a report and the report format varies depending on the class of your device. So if you have a class B, A or B device, it's a post-market surveillance report and it's analyzing and summarizing the results that um, your post, that you've gathered from post-market surveillance. And one of the important things to note is you include a rationale and description of any preventative and corrective actions taken. So this is quite a useful tool because um, if you know of safety considerations that have, have come on the market, you've had to take field safety corrective actions to mitigate the risk and you've taken actions to prevent or, or correct this, well, those corrective and preventative actions are very useful to then feed back into the assessment of your clinical evidence to determine whether uh, whether it's still sufficient or whether you just need to update some of the documentation on it. For class A and class B devices, the report is, is made available to the notified body where applicable and the competent authority uh, may request uh, a copy. Uh, and you update this as necessary. So there's not a defined timeline on, on when you need to, to update this. It's, it's really a, a dynamic process as you identify the need to update it, you, you then uh, you, you make the updates. Class C and Class D devices, uh, the report is called a periodic safety update report. So again, it, it analyzes and summarizes the results and conclusions of post-market surveillance data. Again, you're looking at, at rationales and descriptions of any actions you've taken on the market. But it also sets out that throughout the lifetime of the device, you're looking to conclude on the benefit risk determination. So, you know, does the benefit risk still, uh, you know, equate? Is, is it still a positive benefit risk ratio? You know, you also have a look at the main findings of the post-market performance follow-up in your, your PSUR. And that's rationalized generally in terms of the volume of sales, the use of the device in the intended population and the frequency of, uh, of, of the use of the device. And there's a requirement to update this document at least annually. So just coming back to this, this figure then to, to summarize, on the left, we have the basis of the, of the performance evaluation uh, data, so the foundation, which starts with the performance evaluation plan. There are three pillars, scientific validity, analytical performance and clinical performance, where you will assess what data you have um, or collect what data you have, assess the data, and then determine if you need to generate any additional data. That feeds into your performance evaluation report, which becomes the basis of your clinical evidence. But then as part of your post-market uh, requirements is a post-market performance follow-up, which looks at uh, collecting and assessing uh, information on the performance of your device in the post-market phase. 
It takes in input from the post market surveillance data that you're collecting uh, anyway. And that in conjunction with the outputs of your post market surveillance report and periodic safety update where applicable continuously feeds into your, your uh, performance valuation report and updates the clinical evidence uh, over time. Uh, the last point I just want to make is, is on legacy products because we do get asked this, this question a, a number of times. You know, what are the requirements for my device? Uh, I've, it's been on the market for a number of years. You know, are they different to if it's a new device? So there's no exemption for performance valuation for, for existing devices. The requirements are the same for, for new or existing IVDs. So there, there is no grandfathering. But as I've mentioned during this presentation, uh, if you have an existing device, it's likely that there might be uh, existing information out there that you can leverage, which should simplify the, the performance evaluation process for you. Uh, if you have a new device, you're likely looking at, at trying to, to generate more data um, to, to support the, the use of your device. Just to, to end by thanking you very much and uh, thank you for listening and I'll pass back to Nicola. Apologies for the delay there, I just couldn't um, find the mute button. So thanks very much, Philip, for um, that overview on performance evaluation. And I think you very clearly presented a stepwise approach to how you might go about developing a performance evaluation plan, gathering and generating the data, critically evaluating the data, um, and uh, you know being able to take account of the good and the bad to help formalize a performance evaluation report. So. Um, I think uh, we might start looking at the Q&A now that uh, is coming in and just while while we're looking through the questions, I might start first with Avril, if that's OK, Avril. Um, and it's just my first question is around kind of the classification process and how it influences conformity assessment. So if I have an IVD and I suppose it's similar to the quest or to the, the presentation you gave around the syphilis test, if I have an IVD with two different intended purposes and the technology is identical in each case, do I need to see mark them independently or under two different classification rules? Uh, thanks, Nicola. Sorry, uh, there's a delay there. So um, yeah, it's a good question. So there's no specific requirement to CE mark um, the two devices separately based on the two different intended purposes. However, if the device um, was CE marked with the two intended purposes together, there would have to be sufficient evidence, obviously, to support the claims made by each device based on its own intended purpose and the clinical application. Um, so either, so say if it was the syphilis one and one for diagnosis and the other one was as a screening device, each of those applications would have to be supported by sufficient evidence in the technical documentation. It's important to note as well that if both devices were CE marked as one with two intended purposes, then the higher classification would apply as per implementing rule 1.9. Um, it's whatever one would have the higher classification. So if uh, the screening one would bring it into a class D, then the whole device would be a class D, even though there would be an intended purpose there also as a diagnosis. So important to take that into account. So it's really up to the manufacturer to decide which route um, to go down um, in a situation like this. And the manufacturer then would have to take into account um, all the requirements throughout the whole life cycle um, of the product and maybe you know if there was any difficulties um, around separating um, those two kind of uh, requirements for each of the intended purposes. So it, it's basically up to the manufacturer but there is no um, specific uh, requirement to CE mark um, the two devices separately if they have two different intended purposes. So I hope that answers the question. And I'll pass back to you, Nicola. Thank you. Thanks, Avril. <clears throat> so, yeah, I think very clearly ensure you have evidence to support um, all of the claims being made and um, taking into account the intended purpose. And I might just stay with you, Avril, just because there is one question in the chat. That's uh, it's an easy one because you covered it in your slides. So uh, it's just around 
COVID-19 antibody and antigen tests and the question is typically around what classification they would fall into so you might just recap on that again if that's okay. Okay yeah so thanks Nicola. Um, thanks Nicola. So um, the example that I covered in the slides uh, was a rapid antigen test for COVID-19 um, and yeah as we know there's antibody tests, there's PCR tests um, and uh, there's probably other ones in the pipeline as well. Um, so I'd reiterate there um, that as per rule one um, of Annex 8 it states that it devices that are intended for detection of the presence of or exposure to a transmissible agent that causes a life-threatening disease with a higher suspected high risk of propagation uh, would apply and it would bring those devices more than likely into a class D. Um, so um, very important there that uh, regardless um, of uh, whether it's an antibody or an antigen or what technology, um, it would fall into um, more than likely be classified um, as class D and have the obviously appropriate um, amount of oversight um, applied to it um, that is uh, proportionate to the risk associated with the device. That's all from me, thanks Nicola. Thanks Avril. Um, I might just move over to you Philip now um, and just ask a question around um, the continuous assessment aspect. So an IVD is typically intended to be used at a point in time um, and the IVDR introduces the concept of continuous assessment. So how is it expected that the requirement uh, is interpreted and fulfilled by the manufacturer? Thank you, thank you Nicola. Um, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So yeah, indeed for many IVDs the, the results are relevant for patients uh, in, a, in a short window. So if there is a discrepant result this could result in a, a potential serious or, or non-serious incident uh, depending on the specifics of the device and, and what went on. So from that perspective the individual events are, are kind of captured as, as part of the post market surveillance system. So it's, it's an intended really that uh, from a performance evaluation perspective that the manufacturer develops and implements a plan to assess how the device is performing during the time that it's available on the market. So this should take into account the, the state of the art and, and new scientific data, but also take into account uh, signals from uh, post-market surveillance. So uh, as such, the, the process of, of updating clinical evidence for a device is more high level than, than looking at the, the individual kind of case by, by case level. Uh, it, it takes into account the outputs as I said, from the, the post-market surveillance and, and, and also um, details from, from field safety corrective actions. Uh, so for example, if you had a, a molecular test and there's a new strain or mutation that's developed in the, the target, well, depending on the prevalence in the intended population, you know, this might actually alter the performance of, of the device uh, used on the market. So you know, a manufacturer might take actions to mitigate this risk through a field safety corrective action but then the clinical evidence should be reviewed in light of the, the corrective actions um, to determine that whether the, the evidence remains sufficient to support the use of the device. And it may be that there's an update required. It may be that you, know, you need to, to generate a bit of extra data for the new strain or just to at least assess and determine whether the actions taken have, have impacted the, uh, the clinical evidence or the benefit risk ratio for, for your device. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. Um, and I, I guess just similar, similarly along that line, you know, there is no guidance, I guess, um, available yet on performance evaluation. Um, and, and I know you've set out um, some steps there in terms of gathering that data. And I suppose a question we hear commonly is, you know, how is the se sector expected to be ready on time without guidance? Would you be able to take that question? Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, as we heard yesterday, um, you know, the, the, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic has really kind of changed how we've worked this year. I think it's changed how we've worked for, for all of us and that's, that's evident by the fact that we're, we're doing our, our information day on, on a webinar. Um, so that's resulted in a, in a reprioritization of, of uh, tasks under the IVDR and um, you know, there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but the, I suppose the, the impetus there is to, to identify the bottlenecks for um, implementation of the IVDR and to address these, these potential bottlenecks up front. So we do understand that there's a, a need for guidance in, in a number of areas and there is ongoing work to, to generate that guidance. Uh, 
um, but we'd urge you not to wait for guidance uh, when planning and preparing for the IVDR. Um, so, uh, for example, on, on performance evaluation, there's there's a guidance on the general principles, which is in the process of being finalised for consultation. So hopefully in the in the coming weeks, um, as part of the consultation process, you all might get the opportunity to to look at it and, and provide comments and feedback on this. Um, but there are other guidance documents in the area of performance evaluation, which which will be required. Um, and depending on their ranking in the prioritization may take some time. So again, just to, to reiterate the point, you know, would urge you not to, to wait uh, for guidance before starting or initiating your, your planning activities or before you start uh, uh, getting ready for, for implementing the IVDR. Thank you. Thanks again, Philip. And um, I might just, there was a question in the chat there about the uh, classification review process at the HPRA. Um, and yes, we do have a, a classification um, a classification review process. So if you're looking for, to, um, for, for guidance in terms of classification, uh, we have a review form on our website. Um, you need to provide information regarding the intended use, the technology employed, the mode of action, um, and also uh, there is a fee associated with this, but there is a lot of, uh, there is links on our website to, to how you can uh, access that service and uh, submit classification requests to us. Um, I might just, there was another question, um, Philip, for you on um, Class A devices and um, notified bodies. So it says a Class A device would not involve a notified body, but could they request to see a Class A report? Um, I'll just hand over to you to answer that, Philip, if that's okay. Yeah, that's that's perfect. Um, so I think this is in relation to my slide on, on really the, the post-market um, surveillance report for Class A and Class B devices. At least that would be my understanding. Um, so in that, I think in that slide I mentioned that the notified body might see uh, the uh, request the report uh, as applicable depending on the, the class, I suppose. So it's true, the Class A devices do not require a notified body, but competent authorities can also request to, to see these, um, these documents uh, as part of the technical file. So it may be that a competent authority is interested in, in reviewing the, the document, but I, I can't envisage uh, at this point a, a notified body uh, requesting um, a Class A report for devices that they're, they're not involved in the assessment of. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Philip. Um, we also have a question around classification. Um, you know, why a device for screening purposes would be class D versus one that would be used uh, for diagnosis as class C. Um, and, and they're asking whether uh, a higher classification would apply to a device for screening versus um, uh, versus diagnosis. So Avril, would you be happy to take that question? Yes, um, thanks Nicola. Um, so if we take the example of syphilis, uh, so in terms of screening it, as a screening test, um, then it's in terms of compatibility of blood products. So there's much higher risk of um, an adverse event if somebody is given a, a blood um, product um, um, which can result in them contracting um, syphilis. Um, as opposed to if it's a test for diagnosis, then in terms of risk, um, if they get um, a false negative, there would be possibly other clinical symptoms which would be taken into account um, and the person would might have a delay to diagnosis. Um, but ultimately, um, when you think of the rules and the fact that they are risk-based rules. Um, they are designed the way they are um, to ensure that based on the intended purpose, the proportion amount of oversight is given. So to be really specific, um, the health outcomes associated with um, a blood product um, containing um, that would result in somebody contracting um, syphilis is considered a higher risk um, and also if you imagine that blood product um, could be given to more than one person so definitely um, higher risk then lower risk in terms of diagnosis um, again um, the highest risk there would be um, a false 
negative, um, where um, the person, there would be a delayed diagnosis, but again, they would take into account um, the other uh, clinical um, symptoms. Um, yes, um, yeah, and again, false positive would also take into account the other clinical symptoms. Yeah, so I hope I explained that uh, clearly enough. Um, it's definitely um, in terms of risk to the end user. Thank you. Thanks, Avril. Um, we also have a question on what information a distributor would be required to have on file for IVDs. So uh, I'm happy to take that question uh, myself in relation to um, distributor obligations. So um, I guess, you know, under the IVDR um, and the MDR, the uh, obligations for all economic operators in the supply chain are um, emphasised and they're introduced. So um, I guess it's a new, a new, um, it's a broadening of the scope really for um, for distributors. So it's not intended that a distributor would have to have all of the technical data on IVDs. It's really that the distributor is required to carry out verification checks that the device is CE marked in accordance with the requirements that there's a declaration of conformity to support the device. Um, if there's a certificate, uh, if the device is in the higher risk classes, that there is a certificate um, issued by a notified body for that device, that the labeling is correct, um, and that the uh, manufacturer and uh, or Im uh, importer or authorized rep have registered themselves for that device on UDMED um, or uh, at, uh, or with in the absence of UDMED with the uh, appropriate national authority. So, um, you know, as well as that, the storage and transport conditions need to be met in that case. And um, I suppose distributors have uh, a, an onus of due care for that device and to follow and implement those requirements around the device um, integrity. So, um, and I suppose finally, the, the really importantly is that there's a complaints process in place and that they're able to feed back information on complaints or reports that they're receiving around those devices to the manufacturer and to the competent authority and follow up on any of those um, aspects as required. So I, I think really in terms of um, today uh, today's session, um, i just conscious, I know there's more questions coming in, but we are running close to time. So um, I think really I would like to thank our speakers today. And in terms of the questions themselves, while uh, there are still some outstanding, we do hope uh, to take on board these questions and see how best to address them, um, be it through guidance or our website updates um, in, in future. Um, in, I, I suppose in terms of today, I'd really like to thank our presenters for their perspectives on IVD or implementation. Um, we will use the questions, as I said, to uh, inform our communications in the future. We hope you found the session valuable and um, we look forward to meeting those of you who are dialing in to the remaining sessions this week at the same time from 11 to 12. Um, and just by way of reminder, we have the agenda for the rest of the week on the slide. Uh, we also have um, a feedback survey and I'll go to a slide with a, a code on that. And we would really appreciate your, your feedback on today's session. So just by way of recap for the rest of the week, for tomorrow we have a focus on economic operator obligations within the supply chain um, and UDMED and registration. So there will be a lot more practical discussion around some of those questions around the other economic operators in the supply chain and the, their obligations therein. On Thursday, we have a focus on market surveillance activities um, and on the remote manufacturer inspections and distributor pilot inspections as well. Um, and then finally on Friday, we have a dedicated session to all things clinical. So um, we'd be delighted to have Tom Melvin uh, talking to the sufficient clinical data and equivalents and update on the clinical work programme for 2021. 
So just in terms of the feedback, um, I just like to thank everybody who's involved in preparing for today. All of our speakers, our corporate events team, Gemma and Ruth, our comms and policy team and helping with the production, our IT colleagues and the AV company, MJ Flood. And I would ask that you take um, a couple of seconds just to log your feedback survey. If you go to menti.com on your uh, phone or device and input the code that's on the screen there, uh, it should be available in the chat as well. Um, and there's just two questions there and it'll just help us to evaluate the events from this week. Um, and that's it really from us. I'd just like to say thanks very much for tuning in and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.